Hi, I'm Paul Guppy. I am Vice President for the Washington Policy Center, and this is our regular weekly update about what is going on in our glorious state capitol during the legislative session and the bills that we are tracking, and more importantly, those bills that are moving on and likely to be passed and sent to the governor, and of course, that will affect the lives of all of us when they are enacted. In the meantime, we uh, just want to keep track of what is going on. We are past the latest legislative cutoff date, which was last Tuesday, February 13th. And what that deadline was for bills to pass their House of Origin, either the House or the Senate, to still be considered alive for the year. Of course, there are all kinds of exceptions to that rule, which is uh, that doesn't count for budget bills, transportation funding bills are on a different track. And of course, the greatest uh, exception of all is the Democrat leaders in the House and the Senate can decide to do whatever they want. These are just internal rules. So no bill is technically dead until the session adjourns. But still, when cutoff dates pass, it give us, gives us a good idea of them narrowing down from 1,200, 1,500 bills, maybe just to now a few hundred bills that are being considered. And then some dozens of bills will end up going to the governor. That's where we stand now. We are a little more half, more than halfway through the session. It is day 37 of a planned 60-day session. I want to give an update on a major change that happened just last Friday, and that is a week ago Friday, SB 5770, which was major legislation to repeal the 1% limit on the increase in property tax, regular property taxes every year. As I mentioned before, that policy was voted in by the voters. It's been in place for 23 years. It's popular. It's successful. It works. This bill would have repealed that and put in a 3% limit instead. So in other words, tripling the amount that jurisdictions all across the state could increase the regular property tax. That proposal is now dead for the year. That comes from the best source possible. The sponsor of the bill, who is Senator Jamie Peterson from, uh, Peterson rather, from uh, Seattle. So when the sponsor of a bill announces that it's not going to move forward, then that's pretty reliable. What's interesting is what the senator said about why the bill had failed. He didn't discuss the merits of it. He instead addressed process. For, in an analytical world, that's one indicator that a policymaker is proposing either a weak or an unpopular policy. When they talk about the mechanics of the, of, uh, the legislative process instead of what the bill says. In this case, the sponsor said, that uh, he, the bill failed because, and the quote here, we need to do a better job of explaining why this bill affects only a small proportion of the property tax. So his defense is the public is just not informed about what a great bill this is and how increasing property taxes is a great idea. And by the way, it would only affect a small amount of your property tax, not property taxes across the board. Well, he's kind of giving away the game there, which is, oh, so you mean there are many other kinds of property taxes that also go up? Maybe the counter argument is we need more limitations. If the 1% limit is only on the regular property tax, we might need limits on other kinds of taxes so that the financial burden is not increased quite so much. And that was an in interesting uh, comment on his part. The other argument that he made, because lawmakers who want to raise taxes they always front the most popular and basic public services that they are. They, ne they never talk about funding low priority services. So of course the Senator referred to counties and cities have to have more money for police and public safety and protection. To us, this is ironic because Democrat lawmakers, particularly on the left, were at the forefront of the defund the police movement. Seattle has lost about 400 officers. That's nearly a third of the force. Other cities across uh, Washington, especially those who are more on the left side of the spectrum, uh, have, have lost public safety officers as well. And that is purely a choice, an ideological policy out there about defund the police. Democrats are now backing away from that. And one of their arguments for raising taxes now is, well, we have to fund the police. So it's a complete reversal of that position. The practical effect is uh, uh, pro popular property tax limitation, 1% per year stays in place. And because of other sources of revenue, uh, counties and cities and the state itself are not underfunded. As I've reported before, they have plenty of money and we have the numbers to show that. 
<clears throat> Next is um, a specific attack that was made on one of the six initiatives that have been introduced. Actually, I'll get to that in a second, because just late breaking on Friday, late Friday afternoon, the um, leaders of the House and the Senate, uh, Speaker Lori Jenkins and Senator Billick and over on the Senate side, announced that they're, they do plan to hold hearings on some of the six popular initiatives that the people have sent to the legislature. I've reviewed these before. So the update is <clears throat> the leaders have said that they intend to schedule hearings on three of the initiatives. And those three are the most popular ones, as you would expect. Initiative 2113, and that is to amend uh, police pursuit to give more authority to the police to capture criminals. Initiative 2111, that is uh, a state income tax ban. It would also ban local income taxes. And Initiative 2081, and this is the parental rights initiative that allows parents to get information about their schools, what the curriculums are, what the books are in the library. A lot of things that parents discovered about their schools uh, by watching their students online during the COVID lockdown. The three initiatives that the leaders announced they would not be holding hearings on are Initiative 2117, the carbon tax repeal, 21, Initiative 2109, the capital gains income tax that was enacted in 2021, and Initiative 2124 to repeal the long-term care payroll tax, which is also very unpopular. What do we notice about this pattern? <laughs> the three initiatives that they are willing to have hearings on are ones that do not make major structural changes in the government that are popular and are sort of easy for the Democratic majority to accept. The three initiatives that they have said, no way, we're not even gonna talk about them, follow the same pattern. Each of them expands the size and power of government. Each of them is a funding source for the government. And I think there's no doubt that behind the scenes, the Democrats said to themselves, hey, these initiatives that are bringing billions of dollars of more money into the coffers, uh, we're not gonna hold hearings on those. I think what they're concerned about is if they create a public forum, thousands of people will sign up to argue against them. That is, they're under no obligation to pass these initiatives, but it is not a good look to ask the public to comment and then turn around and say, we are not gonna pass these initiatives. Holding a hearing is not the same as enactment. So we'll have to wait to see whether the three uh, initiatives that will have hearings are actually gonna move through the process. It could be all symbolic just for show, hey, we had a hearing and then no further action. But it does create an expectation that the House and the Senate will take the initiative seriously. There's also a possibility in a classic dynamic democracy, uh, this happens in parliaments all around, the, uh, all around the world, that the Republicans will peel away some percentage of Democrat members to vote for these. Who can vote against parental rights? Who would vote against uh, giving more authority to the police? Well, maybe some of them would. Um, <clears throat> who is not, doesn't want to go on record as uh, not supporting an income tax? Again, more left-wing members would say fine, but in a way, Initiative 2081 is sort of a throwaway. We don't have an income tax now, officially, um, so why not just go on record being against it? The others, as I said, are providing literally billions of dollars of additional revenue to the government. I don't think the Democrats are going to be so anxious to give those out. Uh, we would argue the capital gains tax is an income tax. There's no question that technically and factually it is. Uh, our Supreme Court labeled it an excise tax in order to squeak it through our state constitution. There's been some argument back and forth about that. Um, regarding uh, uh, one of the initiatives, Initiative 2109 is uh, that one on repealing the capital gains tax. Uh, the uh, Senate leader came out with the first attack that we have seen on any of these initiatives. So that gives us an idea what the arguments are going to be. Uh, he essentially said that the state will lose money if the capital gains income tax is repealed and that it will, quote, devastate K-12 education funding. Neither of those statements is true. We provided a, a brilliant fact check analysis to show why. So our response to this is on our website. And what we explain a very straightforward way is, <laughs> this is so classic in government, uh, the state is not gonna lose any money, okay? All of the projection of revenue under the capital gains in income tax is in the future. 
So to make a statement, and we say this, it's just simply not true that the government will, quote, lose money. Uh, what that means is people in government think that money that they have banked on paper mentally already belongs to them. It's in a way they put the public in debt already into the future for a policy that hasn't even gone into effect yet. So uh, we, we did a fact check to point that out. And we think it's important to change the language around the way the government funding is discussed because this expectation is created that, well, things are going to be cut. K-12 is going to be devastated. It's simply not true. In K-12 funding, um, our analyst Lee Finna has pointed out we're spending more money than ever per student, over $19,000. Public education has plenty of money without new revenue sources. So what we're really you know, offended by is this accusation that somehow not carrying through a future tax policy is a cost to the government. We think that people in government should be more sensitive to the cost of the rest of us when they use this kind of language. So the next issue is uh, Senate Joint Memorial 8006 is back. <laughs> when I said that, you know, things that don't pass don't necessarily make the cutoff, they can come back. This memorial is, we thought, had died in uh, in the House. Instead, it is back as being considered in committee. And what it would do is call on Congress to create a socialist universal health care system in Washington state. We are quick to point out that it's not universal health care because every other country that has tried this ends up putting people on rationing, reducing the quality of care, reducing access to doctors. So-called universal health care is not universal. Hawaii and Vermont have tried these systems at the state level, two of the most bluest states in our country, and the lawmakers there canceled both programs and they pulled back. Uh, to ask Congress to uh, give the state this permission means that all Medicaid money, all Medicare money, and any other fund federal funding related to health care would go into a single, one-size-fits-all mandatory health care system we think this is a terrible idea. And even though a memorial is just a request, it's not a binding bill on the federal government, obviously, we believe in jumping in early and arguing the merits of what's being pushed instead of saying, oh, that's just symbolic. It doesn't have any binding effect. The way that government grows is by boiling this frog slowly, as they say, introducing an idea getting people used to it, and then implementing it from there. <clears throat> Another um, example of our success that we've had on the long-term care tax is Elizabeth Hovde was invited by the Seattle Times to provide a guest editorial, uh, which was published on February 8th, and that is about the initiative to repeal the long-term care tax. So again, our information is educating the public about what these initiatives would do. Another bill that passed, uh, uh, one of the houses and it passed the house on February 12th, it's still alive, is HB 1893. This bill would, uh, for the first time ever, extend unemployment benefits to workers who go on strike. Unions, especially in the public sector and in education, love this idea. It gives them a cudgel, essentially, to use during negotiations. Hey, if you don't agree to the new contract or an increase in spending, then we're going to go on strike and automatically striking workers would receive unemployment insurance benefits from the state. That bill passed by 53 to 44 on a partisan vote. Guess what? All the Democrats voted for it. The Republicans voted against it. Uh, every Anytime that we see a controversial bill pass on partisan lines, that's also an indicator of bad policy for the state. If you can't get broader agreement, it's a sign that it's maybe not such a good idea. Um, the other part of this bill, and again, Elizabeth has um, analyzed it, and that is, hey, we understood that unemployment insurance is insurance. That is to say, uh, risk mitigation. When unfortunate things happen in life, you lose your job, a factory closes, um, you're laid off. That's what this social safety net is for. To go on strike is a man-made act. That is a planned activity that union leaders and workers can uh, count on in advance. And of course, they can already calculate the benefits that they'll get. So we think this goes against the idea of what the unemployment insurance program was for in the first place. Um, the other problem is that it undermines trust in a government program. One good argument to allow privatized insurance, uh, if we could have a system like that. And then lastly, uh, on a positive note, 
Uh, bill has been introduced, which would speed up construction of new ferries badly needed on Puget Sound. It would allow uh, the building of two clean diesel ferries over the next few years. Uh, this bill faces an uphill battle. Governor Inslee is opposed to going in this direction, but we think it's a good idea that there's positive legislation that would actually deliver ferry service for the people of our state. The ferries are in crisis. Uh, they can't provide the service that they need to. Uh, and the governor's mandate that only electric hybrid ferries are allowed in the future is slowing down construction of new ferries. Our uh, analysis, uh, analysis shows that if we did not have that mandated policy, we would have at least two brand new ferries in service right now. Those have been pushed off into 2028 or even beyond. So new legislation that tackles that is a good idea. And to wrap up, uh, we're still forging ahead with great events that we do. Our Young Professionals Program held a book club meeting last Thursday. That was a lot of fun. And uh, uh, that was at our new offices in downtown Seattle. So great location if you're in the area please feel free to stop by. And we're doing our usual on-the-go live presentation next Tuesday, February 20th, uh, giving an update about what our legislative directors are doing. And lastly, I want to well, uh, wish everybody a uh, happy uh, President's Day coming up this weekend. And I can't help but note, since we are the only state that is named after an American president, George Washington, I think it's particularly a good time to uh, recognize his service to our country. Our country wouldn't even exist if it were not for George Washington. He's a remarkable person in history, no matter how you look at it. And I don't think there are very many um, great military leaders in any country that have voluntarily given up office twice in order to see, secure freedom for their countrymen. And I think that I've admired George Washington for that reason. And even though we've had historical debates now and a lot of revisionism, I think that fact still remains. So with that, have a great weekend, everybody, and I will talk to you next week.